biggest success has been the move into cloud IT services. So we, we really are the market leader in New Zealand. We've made a huge shift. We've built a business from nowhere in four years to be well over $200 million revenue run rate today and already profitable in cloud IT. Uh, we, uh, I'm very excited by what, by what we're achieving in data analytics as well. We've got a really unique business in Curious that is, uh, that's sailing along there and we've done some incredibly cool partnering with the likes of Spotify uh, and our own Lightbox service uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the mass market or in consumer services. So, so they'd be very successful, but we, uh, we flopped with mobile payments, which sounds weird. We're a mobile utility, we work with our partners, but didn't work, we had to abandon that. We had a, we had a good go at, uh, at sporting content um, with the EPL and others through Lightbox Sport. We just couldn't uh, get traction there either and, and, uh, and a number of other things that have, we'd describe as sort of average results. So we're learning and, uh, and we do take a lot of time and effort to think about you know, what succeeded and what failed and what are the differences and how do we make sure we get more of the success and less of the fail in future. Do you sense there's um, a big shift going on towards technology, um, particularly any kind of weightless or high technology or ICT? So some of the insights from, uh, from Israel, you know, one or two of the key things there would be that our spend on R&D in business is very low uh, relative to Israel and other leaders on innovation. There's a distinct lack of commercialisation capital and capability in New Zealand and so Again, we're not short of good ideas, but we are short of the commitment to the high-risk capital and the sort of seasoned entrepreneurs that it takes to develop good ideas into great businesses. That's, that's tricky. And, um, and so you know, it takes a, a really big organisational commitment. You have to be brave. You have to steer down some of your current investors who say, look, you're just a yield stock. Can you just send all the dividends to us? We make the portfolio decisions as shareholders, not you as a you know traditional company. But New Zealand has a lot of big domestic focused, fairly traditional businesses, and that's a challenge if we don't license them to get on and do more high risk investing in these disruptive digital future technologies. You've been outspoken on the question of e-commerce and tax. Uh, are you happy with the progress the government's making on that? I am very concerned about uh, the impact of these global juggernauts in digital services, you know, your, your Facebooks, Google, Amazon. They, they have incredible backing, they're playing a very long game. The digital nature of their businesses means they come in and they take the market incredibly fast and the customer preference is extraordinary and rides roughshod over, therefore, all of the rules and regulations in any country, be it censorship standards for, for content on the internet or on streaming services, tax rules for uh, digital advertising or sales of imported goods from Amazon, um, or all sorts of investment standards around that. So I, so, you know, our tax laws, our, our laws of operations are driven, you know, in a, nine, in a 20th century view actually of bricks and mortar and people being involved in everything in these new businesses. That's not how it is. And we've got to be mindful that, you know, companies, these large companies enter with a long term view. They want all the value eventually uh, and they're prepared to chase it. And, you know, I, was, I thought it was a stunning statement by Amazon late last year when they entered Australia and said the mission is to destroy retail in Australia, quote unquote. Um, we've got to be mindful of that sort of market power uh, and keep on the pace and move quickly, not at the glacial speed some of these global committees operate in addressing these uh, balance and remember many companies have a vested interest, uh, many countries have a vested interest in making it move at a glacial speed. I think we're, we're more likely to be a victim of these uh, changes uh, than a winner uh, as a result of them. So we need to protect um, the laws of our land and the commercial practice. How do you see the content game evolving uh, with Netflix and Lightbox and the other players? Well, in, in media, 
it's very clear, I think, that the customer preference is for on-demand consume, consumable media to any device, anywhere, anytime. That, the, 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 the customer benefit of that type of media service relative to fixed broadcast appointment-based viewing or all-you-can-eat bundles in, an, in a classic old pay TV service or being bound to a set-top box. From our perspective, that model's consigned to history. The future's here and it's arriving very quickly. And as you mentioned there, a million viewers already in New Zealand of, of, uh, of, of call it paid streaming services. That's viewers, not subscribers. That's people who are watching in the home. It, that occurred in 15 months since they arrived in New Zealand. Um, if you go back to, to pay TV in the 1990s emerging, probably took closer to 15 years to hit uh, that sort of penetration, which is again a reminder when digital comes, it comes very, very quickly. Um, our aspirations are, are we call our uh, Lightbox and as well as Netflix service, we will never beat the globals in the general entertainment game. So while Lightbox is relatively a copy of Netflix today, it won't be. Uh, we, we had to get a start, we used we used that to get a starting position increasingly to be relevant a service like Lightbox uh, has to create a more locally biased content proposition focus on the things that global organizations probably won't because they're too small but can still be quite compelling uh, for New Zealanders and so we think a lot about how we access uh, that that type of content and how we drive the proposition toward it in a way that we can manage without undue risk and that's a very, very hard uh, puzzle to solve it, um, because you can, you can easily look and say well, why don't they just spend 200 million a year and buy up everything, well the chance of us getting 200 million a year in revenue on the back of that anytime soon is very low so it would be a brave decision to just go that way. And the, the key thing we have done and done well relative to anyone else in the New Zealand market is build an audience. We have, we are the market leader without question and by a long way with Lightbox as a New Zealand streaming service. Our, we can see the traffic on our network, we know how much we've got. Uh, we're, you know, so in terms of having, footing it with a global like Netflix and whoever follow them, a Amazon Prime's on its way, there'll probably be others. You know, you've got to have an audience because there's no viability in any single idea if you haven't got an audience that's attractive and that gives you a fighting chance of monetizing a material investment in content, whether you buy it, whether you fund it to be made or whatever. And so we're starting to get more excited about our potential to, to do something with that base now. It's a, it's a big challenge to create a position that can be viable in our small market in that it is headed toward creating unique content that New Zealand's value enough to pay f to pay enough for that would cover its costs. And the Commerce Commission decision not to allow uh, Sky and Vodafone to merge uh, was one that you greeted with some relief um, and kept open, enabled you to um, keep open some options um, in those strategic choices. Yeah, look, just to be clear, our, our objection was not to the merger per se. Our objection was to the merger being allowed if a bottleneck asset, that bundle of sport which Sky have expertly created and locked up for many years, is a bottleneck asset when you try to shift it from one industry into another. And I think that's the conclusion the Commerce Commission came to. They actually said they also, the Commission's um, final decision said they weren't opposed to the merger per se and probably would have allowed it if they had dealt with that uh, providing a wholesale access regime to that bundle of critical content that all, new, you know, all, not all, but a large portion of New Zealand would like. And that was our position too. So uh, it is how it's done in many other places in the world. And all, all they needed to do really was put up a viable, long-term and sustainable wholesale arrangement that other ISPs like Spark, but everyone else, could access and bundle that content in interesting ways 
uh, with their services, and, uh, and and you know we would have been uh, relatively neutral about Sky and Vodafone merging. Um, in terms of Spark's technology and investment, you just announced uh, the next big step, which is the um, converged communications network. So it all becomes entirely IP, uh, yeah, and yeah. there's there's no more copper wires at that point. Can you talk about where this is at, or is this still behind closed doors? What we actually see is a wireless future, and in a funny way, it's not really a wireless future, it's a wireless today, because we tend to think about uh, the market today as both you know, wireless or mobile services and broadband, broadband being a fixed service, but if you think about how broadband is applied at work or at home, you're nearly all on wireless devices, so broadband's just a wireless hub uh, into a premise. So we think the future is all wireless, that actually all devices will just connect directly to wireless hubs, and, you, and that you probably don't need the per-premise hub in a 5G uh, cellular future. So already today with 4 and 4.5G four and technologies, we can get um, speeds of hundreds of megabits per second. So devices will just connect back to a pervasive wireless network. They'll be coded to you. They have electronic SIMs in them, not little card SIMs in the future, so they're very easy to uh, software uh, redirect, uh, et cetera. So we believe in a wireless future, and therefore we're setting our business up more strongly around the wireless inputs we need. So we're much more interested in fibre backhaul to a small cell network with a 5G overlay than we are necessarily a fibre into every single premise in New Zealand. We don't think uh, that everyone will need that uh, when, when there is you know, pervasive 5G, which operates like big Wi-Fi, it's just per street instead of per home. So, so that's the difference, and we think we, we're sourcing the fibre inputs for that. And to the, with today's technology, we, uh, we, what we are focused on is moving on from copper-based services, which we think are becoming increasingly challenged to serve and, uh, and have reliability problems. We're pushing our customers as fast as we can to fibre if they're a high-volume household or business, and to wireless uh, broadband services where they're a low-volume user.